Heavenly Father, once again, we invite your presence. We ask that you would bless us this Sabbath day, this Sabbath evening, with your presence, through your spirit, your angels. Awaken us to the times that we're living and into our own hearts. Open our hearts up to us that we see the areas that we need to surrender to you. We ask that you would do a work in us that would make us fit representatives of you and your character to those that we come in contact with. We want to go home. We want to finish this work. And we thank you for the easy times that we have to come together and study these things. As we know, easy times are rapidly fading away. In Jesus' name, amen. The last presentation was basically an overview of some of the rules of Bible prophecy and principles and concepts that we're going to use to try to illustrate some of the truths from this point onward. Um, I didn't get through all of the material last time. One of the, the bottom line, not, one of the important truths that we're going to deal with as we unfold this weekend is the importance of the last six verses of Daniel 11. Um, that is the message of the hour, from my understanding, and the king of the north in the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the papacy. And the papacy is also portrayed in Revelation 17 as modern Babylon. So there was one other first and last that I wanted to point out to you. There are several other first and last in Scripture that for me are Christ's signature on prophecies. When you see a piece of truth and you see that, it's, that the first part of that prophecy is illustrating the last part of that prophecy, you're, you're seeing Christ's signature in that prophecy. That's my term. There may be a better way to express it. But in the book of Daniel itself, in the book of Daniel, in the first two verses in Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, you'll see this in your notes on page 8, you see the king of Babylon coming into Jerusalem and conquering it. But the book of Daniel, it reaches its climax in verses 40 to 45 of Daniel 11. And once again, when you get to verses 44 and 45 of Daniel 11, you see the king of the north attacking the glorious holy mountain. And the glorious holy mountain in the scriptures is just another way of saying Jerusalem. And so what I'm suggesting to you is you can show that the king of the north is spiritual Babylon. So you see at the beginning of the book of Daniel, a warfare between Babylon and Jerusalem. And at the end of the book of Daniel, you see the warfare between Babylon and Jerusalem. The only difference is, is that in the beginning, Babylon prevails and Jerusalem loses. But at the end, Jerusalem, God's people, are victorious and Babylon comes to its end. So with none to help, the verse says. So that's another first and the last. I wanted to throw that in there because we will be considering the last six verses of Daniel 11 as we go on. But this here um, is a book written by P. Gerhard Dampsteed, who is a, a professor of theology at Andrews University. And one of the courses that he teaches is on the Millerite time period. This is a difficult book to get. Um, because he prints his book, from what I understand, for his course. You know, it's, it's not really, uh, he don't mind selling the book, but he doesn't print it to go into the ABCs. He prints it so the students that come through his class have a, their textbook. And in the last year, we've come to understand this book, and two times, uh, we've bought all that were available. You know, the, and then the second time, they reprinted, and there was a certain amount left, and we bought all those. So I don't know that you can get this except at the cycles that they're being printed for upcoming classes. But from my human perspective and other friends that have looked at this, this is the very finest book on the Millerite time period that there is. And we're going to study the Millerite time period a little bit here and see that it is very important for us to understand the Millerite time period. And uh, we ha we ha I'm not trying to sell anything, but we have some of these books and they'll be available on Sunday. I'm not trying to make a sales pitch, but I'm just pointing to this book as the classic. The, he goes in, he sets up the, the um, economic environment, the religious environment, the cultural environment of the United States in the Millerite time period, and then he documents uh, what went on in the Millerite movement. Uh, he read through all the ancient uh, Millerite publications, and he brings light to bear on that. And then when you understand that the Millerite time period is going to be repeated again at the end of the world of the very letter, you see that some of the things that were going on uh, in the Millerite time period 
are happening here at the end, and, and this is the documentation for some of that, if you come to the understanding that it is repeated, and that's what we're going to deal with at this point. Page 9, Christ the Bridegroom. <coughs> The past history of the cause of God needs to be often brought before the people, young and old. We need often to recount God's goodness and to praise him for his wonderful works. Um, you know, when there's many times where Sister White, and I don't have these in this particular presentation, but I'm sure some of you are aware that there are many times where Sister White speaks about the deliverance from Egypt with ancient Israel, the story of how God brought ancient Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea, that that was the prophetic point of reference for ancient Israel. They were to teach their children about that deliverance. Uh, they were co to commemorate that deliverance throughout all their generations. That was their point of reference. And over again, over and over again, Sister White will refer to that in connection with Adventism and say that our point of reference is the Millerite time period. What the deliverance from Egypt was for ancient Israel is what the Millerite time period is supposed to be for us. So I want to show you something, if you will. We've already touched on this briefly. We will develop this throughout the weekend. First angel's message was empowered in 1840. That's when it came into history. We'll give you quotes on that. Second angel's message came into history in 1842. Third angel's message came into history in 1844. Followed here by a disappointment, all right? Um, before this time period, you have darkness. Um, then William Miller's raised up. William Miller receives his credentials in 1833. Actually starts sharing the message in 1831, but he gets his credentials in 1833, the same year of the falling of the stars, which Jesus said was going to be the sign that the second coming was drawing nigh. So I... I refer to 1833 in association with Miller beginning to present his message. But William Miller, and we're going to read quotes on it, he brought a message of reform. Sister White emphasizes four things about William Miller's message. It was a reform, an awakening message, a call to preparation, and a warning. Warning, reform, awakening, preparation. So William Miller is the one that's associated with the first angel's message, a message of reform. Then the second angel's message comes into history when the organized churches close their doors against the Millerite movement. Babylon has fallen, second angel's message. And at this point in here, we have the midnight cry where the Holy Spirit is poured out. It's in the second angel's message where the Holy Spirit is poured out. And then you have the judgment, right? Follow me on the judgment, October 22nd, 1844, at the third message, followed by a disappointment. And we're waiting for the fourth angel's message. What, what history, we call this the latter rain, loud cry message, right? Fourth angel's message. The latter rain is prefigured in scripture by what? What's the classic example of the, the prefigures and points to the latter rain? Pentecost, right? Pentecost, the latter rain at the end of the world has been prefigured by Pentecost during the beginning of Christianity. Everyone follow me, okay? So I want to show you something real quickly if I can. This history of the Millerite time period, the first, the second, the third angel's message, at some point in time to be followed by the fourth. This is our point of reference. And the deliverance from Egypt was the ancient Israel's point of reference. And in the story, I'm going to go very quickly with this, before ancient Israel was delivered from Egypt, there was darkness everywhere. We know there was darkness because when Moses came back to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, they weren't keeping Sabbath any longer. You read closely the book and see what Sister White says about it. They had quit keeping Sabbath, and when Moses came back in this time period of great darkness, God's people are no longer observing Sabbath, he confronts them with a reform message and says, you need to start keeping Sabbath, which they did, and what did that do? That infuriated Pharaoh and says, okay, we're going to increase the amount of work you have to do in making bricks, and we're not going to give you straw for your bricks anymore. You've got to go out and gather your own straw. It was because of a message of reform brought by Moses that this process began. And what I'm saying is that Moses is a type of William Miller who brought a reform message. At the second angel's message, you have this mighty manifestation of the Holy Spirit during the midnight cry. 
after Messi William Miller's message of reform, you have the outpouring of the ten plagues, which is a mighty manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And what was the final plague? It was judgment on the firstborn. And then Sister White says that when, right after the, the judgment, what do they call the judgment in history? What's it called as a festival? Passover? Passover. The judgment of the firstborn in the story of Egypt is called Passover, right? Am I going too fast for everyone here? Immediately after Passover, Pharaoh lets them go, and they, they head for the promised land, and they find themselves between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. And you know what Sister White says about them at that point? That they were greatly disappointed that they had left Egypt, and they seen the army coming after them to kill them, and the water's in front of them. And you know what she uses that history to parallel? She uses that history when they were disappointed, and she uses the word disappointed before the Red Sea to illustrate the disappointment of the Millerites immediately after October 22, 1844. But they made it across the Red Sea, and 50 days later, where do they find themselves? Pentecost. They find themselves here receiving the law. And that's what Pentecost, why they've commemorated Pentecost, is because Pentecost means 50 days. Penta, 50. 50 days after this deliverance, they're receiving the law. They were to commemorate this throughout all their generations. So what am I saying? I'm saying that just as William Miller was raised up during a time period of darkness to bring a message of reform, so did Moses do the same thing. And this reform message was followed by a time period where the Holy Spirit was uh, exhibiting its power. And that time period led into a judgment. In Egypt, it was the firstborn. In the Millerite time period, judgment began in the heavenly sanctuary. It was followed by a disappointment. And then the Pentecost is prefigured. In the time period of Christ, we're told that there was great darkness and the Lord raised up someone. Who did he raise up for that great darkness in the time period of Christ? John the Baptist brought a message of reform. And if you go very carefully into early writings, you'll see that Sister White talks about three steps in that time period that par parallel the midnight time period. Sister White says the, the midnight cry of the second angel's message, what does she compare that to in the time period of Christ? The triumphal entry into Jerusalem. She ties that history of the Millerite midnight cry time period into the triumphal entry that led to the cross. And the cross is the judgment. See, that's, that history of Christ is the same history. And what does Sister White most often use to describe the disappointment of the Millerites after October 22, 1844? The disappointment of the disciples after the cross. And then came Pentecost. Now, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is prophecy is portrayed on lines, and we're to bring the different lines together, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And the history of the Millerite time period, the first, second angels, and third angels message coming into history is sacred history for Seventh-day Adventists. It's just as sacred for Seventh-day Adventists is the history of the deliverance of, from Egypt for ancient Israel. And not only is it just as sacred, but it has the identical characteristics. It has a, a three-step three testing process with the same characteristics in the steps, followed by a disappointment that leads to Pentecost. This same history was in the time period of Christ. It's the same history that took place in the Millerite time period. The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. So, back to our notes. Adventism illustrated. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. If you want to understand the experience of Adventism, study the parable of the ten virgins. Next quote, when the third angel's message is preached as it should be, power attends its proclamation. It becomes an abiding influence. It must be attended with divine power or it will accomplish nothing. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. Brothers and sisters, the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter in the Millerite time period, and it's going to be fulfilled again to the very letter at the end of the world. And that parable is identifying the experience of Adventism, the experience of the Millerites, the experience of Adventism. Jesus has portrayed the end of Adventism with the beginning of Adventism. 
Jesus is portrayed um, the omega of Adventism with the alpha of, omega, of Adventism. So we're going to look at um, the history of the Millerites here from some quotes and get kind of specific about what went on there. <coughs> Early writings, 245 and 248. I was shown the interest which all heaven had taken in the work going on upon the earth. Jesus commissioned a mighty angel to descend and warn the inhabitants of the earth to prepare for his second coming. As the angel left the presence of Jesus in heaven, an exceeding bright and glorious light went before him. I was told that his mission was to lighten the earth with his glory and warn men of the coming wrath of God. Multitudes received the light. Another angel. Now, in this, so far, how many angels now? Another angel. How many angels have we got to? Two. All right. Another angel was commissioned to descend to the earth. Jesus placed in his hand a writing, and as he came to earth, he cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Second angel, right? Second angel's message is Babylon is fallen. As the people of God united in the cry of the second angel, the heavenly hosts marked with the deepest interest the effect of the message. Jesus commissioned other angels to fly quickly to revive and strengthen the drooping faith of his people and to prepare them to understand the message of the second angel and the important move that was soon to be made in heaven. I saw these angels receive great power and light from Jesus and fly quickly to earth to fulfill their commission to aid the second angel in their work, in his work. A great light shone upon the people of God as the angels cried, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. What, where do we get the phrase, Behold the bridegroom come, go ye out to meet him? The parable of the ten virgins. Sister White has just tied the entrance of the three angels' messages into history, into the parable of the ten virgins. And she's saying this first angel comes down and lights the entire earth with his glory. The second angel is the angel that announces Babylon is fallen. And then these other angels come down to empower the midnight cry, which I have a mark right here. Okay? So uh, I'm, I'm trying to be real technical here. You'll see why as we proceed tomorrow and onward. The first angel that comes is a mighty angel. The second angel is where Babylon has fallen. And it's also during the time period of the second angel when the other angels come and empower that message in the midnight cry. All right? Um, you'll see the quote here on the next page where uh, William Miller began to preach in 1833. It's the top of the page. Um, notice the second quote from Great Controversy 368. To William Miller and his co-laborers, it was given to preach the warning in America. This country became the center of the Great Advent Movement. Notice that depending on how you want to look at these things, you don't have to see the relationship between the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the United States if you don't want to. But it's there. Sister White is saying the United States is wh what was designed by God to become the center of the Seventh-day Adventist Church at the end of the world. She didn't say Brazil became the great center for the Millerite movement. It was the United States, and it wasn't by accident. The Lord planned this, and it's identified. The United States was the center of the Advent movement. It was here that the prophecy of the first angel's message had its most direct fulfillment. The writings of Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands. This book here identifies that just before the summer of 1840, the Millerites had prepared their publications by the thousands, and they were setting in the ports on the west coast and the east coast of the United States. And the, in reality, in 1840, the Millerite message actually was sent all over the world. That's when it happened. And that's in agreement with what Sister White says in other places we're going to look at. In 1840, the message went to the world. And, and that's what she's saying here. The writings of Miller and his associates were carried to distant lands. Now, here's what I want you to see. We're going to develop this as we go through, through further, but I'll point to it right now so you see my point. The first angel's message here has its own characteristics. The second angel's message has its own characteristics. The third angel's message has its own characteristics. They're different. One of the characteristics of the first angel's message is that it's a message that went to the entire world. All right, we're going to find that the second angel's message was primarily for the United States. 
There's a difference between the messages. They have different characteristics. Um, next quote, the power of the Holy Spirit. The transforming power attended the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages as it attends the message of the third. Lasting convictions were made upon human minds. The power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. I'm putting this point in here for this reason. During this history, the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. But I want us to see that also at the midnight cry, there was a greater manifestation. Even though this whole movement was being brought about, all these events were being directed and accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's at the midnight cry where the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. Okay, so I'm, that's why I'm putting this in here. I want to acknowledge this whole time period, the power of the Holy Spirit was manifested. But in the next quote, the first angel's message fulfilled in the entire world. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. Who's the angel who unites with the third angel? The fourth. So she's, she's start, now she's talking about the fourth angel's message in this first sentence. We, we understand that the fourth angel of Revelation 18 is at some point in time going to come together with the third angel of Revelation 14, all right? And that's what she's speaking about here. The angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. She's saying when the, when the fourth angel comes, it's going to be worldwide. Now notice what she says. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every mission station in the world. The first angel's message arrives in 1840. We will show you this as we proceed. The characteristic of the first angel's message is it was carried to every mission station in the world. And what I'm suggesting here, I'm going to hopefully show you decisively as we proceed, is that the fourth angel's message is a repeat of the first angel's message. Because the fourth angel's message will also go to all the world. Um, so what empowered the first angel's message? Next page. The first angel's message, fear God and give him, glory, give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come. The first angel of Revelation 14 is the message that William Miller was delivering to the world, announcing that judgment was going to begin. Is that how you understand it? Is that the message that William Miller was bringing, that judgment's going to begin? No, it wasn't, was it? <laughs> William Miller thought the Lord was going to return and destroy the earth by fire, but he was being used even with a little bit of his incorrect understanding, to announce to the world that judgment was going to begin. He, he didn't quite understand it, but that's what he was doing. Judgment is about to begin. And he started that in 1831, 1833. And up until 1840, if you were to attend a, a meeting that William Miller was giving, it would be similar to the one going on in this house tonight. Just a handful of people. But in 1840... The Lord empowered the Millerite message. And from that point on, instead of having 50 or 60 people at a meeting, there would be three or four, 5,000 people in a Millerite meeting. How did the Lord empower this message in 1840? And you see how here on the top of page 11. <clears throat> in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. She goes on to talk about the time prophecy in Revelation 9.15. There's a time prophecy in Revelation 9.15 of 391 years and 15 days. And that time prophecy came to a conclusion on August 11th, 1840. It was identifying when the Ottoman Empire would collapse. All the Millerite preachers were preaching this message, but as 1840 approached, the Millerites, part of their message was is that in 1840, the Ottoman Empire is going to come to its end. But as 1840 approached, there was one of the Millerite preachers that really got some insight into this prophecy. And he looked at the historical events associated with the beginning of this time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days. And he found he could even identify the very day of 1840 that the Ottoman Empire would collapse. Now, mind you, what was the, what was the tool that William Miller was using to identify that the world was going to end? 
the year day principle of Bible prophecy. William Miller came across the, the 2300 year time prophecy in Daniel 8 14, and he understood that when that time prophecy was fulfilled in 1844, that the world was going to come to an end, and he was making that calculation using the year day principle of Bible prophecy. A day in Bible prophecy represents a year. And he's telling the world in 1844 the world's going to come to an end, and the world's just sitting back thinking, this guy is a fanatic. You know, he's, he's crazy. But there was another time prophecy about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire that was based upon the same principle, the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. And Josiah Litch came to understand that on August 11, 1840, the Ottoman Empire would collapse, and he put it in a booklet, and the whole world laughed and scoffed at these foolish Adventists and their ideas about the year-day principle and the end of the world. And when the Ottoman Empire collapsed on August 11, 1840, suddenly power came into the Millerite movement overnight. That wasn't an accident. That was prophecy. That was God's providence. God was the one that empowered this message through the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. Notice the next quote. We have more to say about these things. This is first presentation of several. We're going to build upon this. <coughs> In June 1842, Mr. Well, if you notice from Great Controversy, before we get to the second angel's message, if you notice this second quote where Sister White's talking about Josiah Litch, let me put this into the record too. Um, after she describes this history of Josiah Litch's prediction and the rejection of his ideas and then the fulfillment, she says the event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates. Multitudes were convicted that the year-day principle of Bible prophecy worked and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. From 1840 to 1844, the work rapidly extended. Here she's saying, from this time period on, the, the message is empowered. Then in 1842, the next quote. In June 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures at the Casco Street Church in Portland, Maine. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the door of their churches against Mr. Miller. Now, when you bring this subject up to, to Seventh-day Adventists, you say, look at the second angel's message arrived in history in 1842. They know a couple quotes. One of them's in the next quote, where Sister White says, the second angel's message was given in 1843 and 1844. Another one, she says, in the summer of 1844, the second angel's message was proclaimed. Yes, the second angel's message was given, was proclaimed in 1843 and 1844. But the second angel's message arrived in history in 1842. The Millerites didn't understand it. When did the third angel's message arrive in history? October 22, 1844. What's the third angel's message? It's a warning against enforced Sunday keeping, right? On October 23, 1844, did the, the wise virgins that entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, did they understand the Sabbath and Sunday test? Nope. Took them quite a while to figure that out. All I'm saying is, Third angel's message arrived October 22, 1844. After that, God's people understood all that it meant. The second angel's message arrived in 1842. And after that time period, they came to understand that message and proclaim it. Uh, in this book, he documents that when they, first, when they first understood, wow, this is the second angel's message. The organized churches have become part of Babylon. Then they had discussions. Well, should we go out and preach this? Should we actually go out and tell people to get out of those churches that they became Babylon? There was a time period after they understood it where they were even afraid to preach it. They didn't, they didn't want to go into churches that they were formerly members of or that they were members of and say, it's time to get out of this church. Ultimately, they did preach it. But the point is, arrived in history, 1842. With me? Even if you don't know where I'm going with it at this point, we're just laying some foundational work. Uh, you've seen the two quotes on when it was preached, the rest of that page. Um, then came the tarrying time. When did William Miller first predict the Lord was going to return based upon the 2300-year time prophecy? 1843. That's the typical answer in Adventism. But was that really what he was predicting? See, the, the, even on the 1843 pioneer chart, he has 1843. But there was various ways of calculating the year during that time period. Were they going to use the Gregorian cal calendar like we do? The year begins in January, ends in December. Or were they going to use the, the Bible um, 
time, of which there was two well-known usages that the Millerites knew of. And my point is this. William Miller believed that the 1843 of the 2300 day of time prophecy began in March of 1843 and it ended in March of 1844. So the disappointment of, of 1843 really didn't arrive until March 22nd of 1844 because they, they figured the year 1843 lasted all the way till March 21st. <coughs> Just so we can have that in our minds. It was actually the beginning of 1843. And in, in, <coughs> in the top of page 12, you have a passage from the Great Controversy where Sister White is talking about the tarrying time. The tarrying time is part of what, part of what illustration in the Bible? Part of the, the story of the parable of the ten virgins. Sister White's talking about a tarrying time from the parable of the ten virgins, and she's tying it into the history of the Millerite time period because when you get down here in this history, William Miller's been telling the world in 1843, the Lord's going to return, but his, his calculations actually allow him to go to March of 1844. And when that didn't come to pass, suddenly the Millerites were in the Tarian time. They, they had to rethink what was going on, and they'd lost their zeal. Their wind had been taken out of their sails. And this was a fulfillment of the Tarian time of the parable of the Ten Virgins. But it's also, you'll see the, the different connections to passages in the Bible that the Lord revealed to them that allowed them to work through the tarrying time correctly. And you see Sister White quoting um, a couple of these passages from Habakkuk and Ezekiel. We're going to deal with those a little bit later. But anyway, uh, what I want to get in the record here in this first presentation is in this time period you reach the tarrying time. <coughs> then the midnight cry comes into history right in here. Brothers and sisters, the midnight cry parallels the loud cry. The loud cry is the latter rain time period. Sister White says the latter rain is going to go as fire in the stubble. What's fire in the stubble? Goes fast. Goes fast. We're in a drought in Arkansas and we've been uh, in our state and several states here in the recent past we've had here there's been a burn ban on and, and we went right up to the end of the burn ban because the days were nice even though it was winter here recently and we'd be out cleaning our forests with fire and there were some of those days were windy, and it was uh, it can get away from you like that. You really got to watch it. That's how Sister White says the latter rain, the fourth angel's message is going to go. And the midnight cry came into history at the Exeter camp meeting on August 12th through 17th in Exeter, New Hampshire, I believe. And so from the 17th, when that camp meeting was over, and those people became convicted of the midnight cry. From August 17th until October 22nd, how many days is that? It's just 60 some days. They took that message they came to understand in that camp meeting in New Hampshire all the way across the United States without any telephones, without any radios, without any internet, without any cars, without any airplanes. The midnight cry is prefiguring the latter rain, and when it finally arrives, it goes as fire in the stubble. That's how it went in the beginning. I mean, you, if you think back to the obstacles that that they had to deal with to get that message out from that camp meeting in 60 days wasn't a work of human devising. And you see this, the bottom of page 12, where Sister White's speaking about this, like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land. Dropping down the middle where it's bold-faced, in the middle of that paragraph, she says, it was similar in character to those seasons of humiliation and returning unto the Lord, which among ancient Israel followed messages of reproof from his servants. It bore the characteristics that mark the work of God in every age. Now, brothers and sisters, what is she saying here? One of the things she's saying is, is it's this mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit here in, the, in this time period, the Millerite time period, the midnight cry. She says it was the same as every age, that there'd been a message of reproof. William Miller, Moses, John the Baptist. When this message of reform is finally received by the people it's given to, then there's a revival that takes place and a work that is done. And she says, it's always the same. Why is it always the same? Because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, and Jesus portrays the end of the world from the beginning of the world. It's always the same. Next page. Um, we're familiar with with this quote, but let's read it for the record. Early Writings, page 15. 
It's one of Ellen White's visions or dreams. As at this I raised my eyes and I saw a straight and narrow path cast high above the world. On this path the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which the angel told me was the midnight cry. Now if you just stop right there, brothers and sisters, what that's saying is that this time period right here of the midnight cry in the, the Millerite time period, this lights the path to heaven for every Seventh-day Adventist all the way to the end. The light from this experience, what does that mean? At least it means there's some kind of information in there that every Seventh-day Adventist that ultimately receives eternal life is going to have to receive. There's something in there that is for us. Now, continuing on. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus and fell off the path into the dark and wicked, wicked world below. The light of the midnight cry is life or death. If we, if we deny that it's light, we go to the wicked world below. That's what she just said. If we accept it as light, then it lights our path all the way to the kingdom of God. So what is it about that light that's as important for me today at the end of the world as it was for the Millerites during that time period? There must be some kind of truth there that is, if, that is life or death for us to understand, right? So when we're looking at this history, it's not simply... Uh, an interesting, fascinating history lesson, there's some important information here. That, that's my understanding. Now, the next quote. I want you to see, if you will, that there comes a point when the second angel's message closes. She says, Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun. And I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. <coughs> angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men were not the first to receive this message. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. We already read that. The parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled in the Millerite time period to the very letter, and it will be fulfilled again to the very letter. And what we just read was, the most talented men were not the first to receive this message. Angels were sent to the humble, devoted ones and constrained them to raise the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Those entrusted with the cry made haste, and in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message and aroused their discouraged brethren. This work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God, and his saints who heard the cry could not resist it. The most spiritual received this message first, and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. In every part of the land, light was given upon the second angel's message, and the cry melted the hearts of thousands. It went from city to city and from village to village until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. In many churches, the message was not permitted to be given, and a large company who had the living testimony left these fallen churches. A mighty work was accomplished by the midnight cry. The message was heart-searching, leading the believers to seek a living experience for themselves. They knew that they could not lean upon one another. This is speaking about the midnight cry coming into the second angel's message as it was closing, as it was closing. She says, near the close of the second angel's message. I, I want you to see, if you will, that we read the quote, the first, second, third angel's message have been located. They've been located by inspiration. And there's more than one quote that says that. And the first angel's message was empowered in 1840, second angel's message came in in 1842, and the second angel's message closes at the third angel's message on October 22nd, 1844. And what I'm trying to do here is specifically isolate the history of 1840 to 44 for us, because you'll see why tomorrow morning. 
the door is shut at the end of the second angel's message. And you'll see at the bottom of your page here the quote from uh, the parable of the ten virgins, which one of the characteristics of the parable of the ten virgins is that there is a time come, that comes in the parable when a door was shut. Next page. I was shown in vision and still believe that there was a shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angel's messages and rejected that light were left in darkness. The first and second angel's messages conclude on October 22nd, 1844, when the door is shut. What door is shut? Well, the door is shut in the parable of the ten virgins. What other door is shut at the same time? The door into the holy place. Because at the same time, the door into the most holy place is opened. So th at the end of the second angel's message, the third angel's message begins. And at the end of the second angel's message, you have a door that is shut. Um, let me re finish reading this for one other point that's in this from the top of the page 14. I was shown a vision and still believe that there was a shut door in 1844. All who saw the light of the first and second angel's messages and rejected that light were left in darkness. And those who accepted it and received the Holy Spirit, which attended the proclamation of the message from heaven, and who afterwards renounced their faith and pronounced their experience of delusion, thereby rejected the Spirit of God, rejected the Spirit of God, and it no longer pleaded with them. So the, the, when, when the door was shut upon them, it was life or death. If the Spirit of God quits pleading with you, you have accomplished the unpardonable sin and you're a lost soul. Um, and if you drop down three to a process of purification, <coughs> from early writings, page 237, it says, As the churches refu refused to receive the first angel's message, they rejected the light from heaven and fell from the favor of God. They trusted to their own strength and by opposing the first message, placed themselves where they could not see the light of the second message. It was a progressive test. You flunked the first message, you're not even around for the second message. You flunked the second angel's message, the Holy Spirit qu quits pleading with you. Early writings, page 56. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. What, what, what throne had he, had he left? What is she speaking about here? She's moved, he's moved from the holy place to the most holy place. And the people that refused to follow him into the most holy place on October 22nd, 1844, but they still profess to be Christians, they continue to direct their place, prayer to the holy place. She says, I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left it. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. There was a door shut right here at the end of the second angel's message, at the beginning of the third angel's message. In this time period, Christ purified his church. The Crest Collection 114 he will purify his church even as he purified the temple at the beginning and the close of his ministry. There are five different places where Sister White refers to the two times that Christ cleansed the temple while he was here on earth, and she compares them to the end of the world and teaches that Christ cleanses his people twice at the end of the world. The first, well, let's read the next quote. She defines what it is. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 118. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14.8. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. The two cleansings of the temple when Christ was here on earth are pointing forward to the cleansing that took place on October 22, 1844, the separation between the wise and foolish virgins that took place during that time period, the foolish virgins refusing to enter into the most holy place, continuing to direct the focus of their worship to the holy place, and 
The historians tell us that at the disappointment of October 22, 1844, the Millerite movement went from roughly 50,000 down to what? 50 people overnight. He purified his church. But Sister White is saying that the second time Christ cleansed the temple when he was here on earth was prefiguring a second purification process that takes place at the loud cry of the fourth angel's message. That's at the Sunday law. The loud cry of the second angel's message takes place at the Sunday law in the United States. We will show you that as we proceed. So there's another purification process coming for God's people at the end of the world. It's the second one. And it's, and it's prefigured here in the Millerite time period because this all gets repeated to the very letter. And as you s next page, you have the quote. We've already looked at it. I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. And then Sister White, we've read this quote um, where she's talking about the light of the, under the light of the midnight cry. The light of the midnight cry is what brightens our path all the way into eternity. And in the next quote, she says, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us. In other words, our safety in the future is to understand the past. It's to understand the light of the midnight cry that took place in this history. Because this history is going to be repeated again to the very letter. And even in the world, they have quotations that he who forgets history is destined to repeat it. And everyone understands that. If you don't understand history, you're going to make the same mistakes that have been made in the past. And this is sacred truth for us as well. The end of the world, the end of Adventism has been illustrated with the beginning of Adventism. Now you may see that at a very surface level. You may say, yes, I've seen the quotes here this evening. I can see that, that there's some evidence that the Millerites fulfilled the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter and it's going to be repeated again, but how, how, what, does, what does to the very letter mean? Brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you that from my investigation, I personally mean, personally believe that it means to the very letter. That everything that went on then is repeated again. And we're going to try to show that over the tomorrow. Um, in next quote, page 15, fourth angel is a type of the first angel. We've read this quote already. I just wanted to point that out to you. Um, the first angel's message was carried to every mission station of the world. It was taken to the world. Where the second angel's message was primarily fulfilled in the United States. We'll show you that tomorrow. But in Revelation 18, the fourth angel's message, when it comes down, how many angels are there in the fourth angel's message? Just out of curiosity, how many, how many angels are there in, in the fourth angel's message of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5? Somebody take a guess. Four, okay. Well, no, I mean just in those verses. Just in those verses. How many angels are illustrated in the fourth angel's message in v Revelation 18, verses 1 through 5? There are two. There's an angel that comes down in Revelation 18, verse 1, and the earth is lightened with his glory. And then John says, and I heard another voice say, come out of her, my people. Fourth angel's message is divided into two parts. The first part goes to all the world. The second part is the call out of Babylon, just like the second angel's message. So when Sister White is comparing the fourth angel's message with the first angel's message, she's comparing the history of Revelation 18 with the history of 1840 to 1844. So does the Bible. Am I losing you? I don't, mind, I don't mind losing you here tonight because we're going to go over this a couple more times tomorrow. And even if you're not following it fully, you're going to see tomorrow that this is well established in the scriptures. Bottom of page 15. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the first and second angel's message refused the third, the last testing message to be given to the world, and a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. Perhaps the most important truth in the parable of the ten virgins, and remember the parable of the ten virgins illustrates the Adventist experience, is in this next principle, the top of page 16. 
There's a crisis in the parable of the ten virgins. They're all sleeping, and suddenly there's a cry, here comes the bridegroom, everybody wake up, and they wake up, and some of the virgins realize that they don't have any oil to follow the bridegroom at, the, at that late hour of night. And there's a crisis in the parable. And there's a crisis when the parable is fulfilled in the Millerite time period, and there's a crisis for God's people when it's fulfilled at the end of the world. And the truth about this crisis that we need to understand is mentioned many times by Sister White. She's going to mention it here, and it's this. Character is never developed in a crisis. It's only demonstrated in a crisis. It's only demonstrated. You, re you reach the crisis, it's too late to develop character. All you're going to do is demonstrate the character that you prepared prior to the crisis. This is one of the most important truths of the parable of the ten virgins. Top of page 16. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers, it, would see, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unaware, but one was left prepared. One was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. So now, a sudden and unlooked for calamity, something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great and final test comes at the close of human probation, when it will be too late for the soul, soul's need to be supplied. Saddest of all words that ever fell upon mortal ears are those words of doom, I know you not. The fellowship of the Spirit which you have slighted could alone make you one with the joyous throng at the marriage feast. In that scene you cannot participate. Its light would fall on blinded eyes, its melody upon deaf ears, its love and joy could awake no chord of gladness in the world-benumbed heart. You are shut out from heaven by your own unfitness for its companionship. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking up when the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for companionship in heaven. There's a world lying in wickedness, in deception, and delusion, in the very shadow of death, asleep, asleep, who are filling the travail of soul to awaken them. What voice can reach them? My mind was carried to the future when the signal will be given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamps. Brothers and sisters, in the parable of the ten virgins, what does the oil represent? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Spirit. Everyone always says Character. Character. Let's read the rest of this. But some will have delayed to obtain the oil for replenishing their lamp, and too late they will find that character which is represented by the oil, is not transferable. The parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself, and every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. We are represented either by the wise or foolish virgins. We cannot now distinguish, nor have we authority to say, who are wise and who foolish. There are those who hold the truth in unrighteousness, and these appear outwardly like the wise. <clears throat> We're going to look at this history from different lines of prophecy tomorrow. Um, we, I started with the parable of the ten virgins because it allows us to put in place the history of the parable of the ten virgins. Let me summarize this history for us. Darkness always proceeds. In, in sacred history, when, there's a, when this history is repeated, you always see darkness illustrated. What was the darkness that precedes William Miller's time period? What do we call it? The Dark Ages. The 1260 years of papal rule brings us to the time of the end. And the Lord raises up William Miller to be the, the man that he uses to confront the world with the first angel's message, an awakening message, a message of preparation. But it wasn't until 1840 that the Lord empowered that message by, in front of the whole world, confirming that the rule of the year-day principle that William Miller was using was accurate with the collapse of that Ottoman Empire. The message continued to go forth, but by 1842, the organized churches in the United States began to prevent William Miller and his associates from coming in their churches, and what did they do? They closed their doors, brothers and sisters. They closed the door of their probation. Protestant churches in the United States went into darkness in 1842. 
There's no excuse for Seventh-day Adventists listening to these Sunday preachers on the TV or the radio. They've been in darkness for over 150 years. That's a fact. They close their doors. Not an accident. Closing the door in Bible prophecy, especially in the, in the parable of the ten virgins where the, bio, the closing of the door is one of the, the characteristics that we need to understand. That's what went on. I want you to see a progression of the close of probation, if you will. Then comes the first disappointment, March 21st, 1844. They couldn't expect 1843 any longer. It's, they know that they were wrong. They go into the tarrying time, and then the midnight cry arrives. The midnight cry is very special. There are certain characteristics on what brought the midnight cry. We will look at that. And the Holy Spirit took the message across the United States in, I, th I think it's 66, 63 days or something. And then the door closed. This history from 1840 to 1844 fulfilled the parable of the ten virgins to the very letter. And the parable of the ten virgins is going to be fulfilled again to the very letter at the end of the world. The light of this history is the light for our path, if we will receive it. That's, that's the reason to be looking at this history. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for preserving this history that we might consider it long after it took place and learn from it that we might be instructed on how to stay on the path to heaven. But we know that there will be those among us that who are declaring the light of the midnight cry as a delusion and not from God and uh, that they're going to be falling off, but they're also going to be putting special temptations between themselves and those who want to stay on the path. We realize that we're in a shaking time. We are in the time period when this history is beginning to be repeated and we ask that you'd especially empower us through your presence to take these studies seriously, compare them with your word, test them to see if they are a genuine truth or spurious falsehood. I ask that each person here would be given a burden to test these things to see if they're so and if they are in their own heart, through their own prayer, through their own study, then I ask that you give them the courage to bring their life into agreement with these truths. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, and we ask for traveling mercy on our ways back home and rest tonight that we might um, meet again tomorrow refreshed and that you would continue to bless the meetings tomorrow and Sunday in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>